Good morning, friends. Welcome to OBE Journal 2018, number eight, I believe. At least some of what we're doing today is uh, interacting with, I'll use the word guides as a general reference. Some of the uh, spirits, not quite sure how many here, uh, might be popularly described otherwise. But uh, not to show prejudice, I'll call them all guides. It seems to have been assembled for me. And I'm uh, bringing up uh, recent memories. As if you've been following my videos, you'll know certain situations seem to be assembled ahead of time so that I and perhaps others can uh, experience the situation and characters involved and talk about it or you know, communicate about it. So this seems to be one of those. As I meditated a few moments ago, that seemed to come into focus. I asked the, uh, the first guide that uh, I can recall uh, meeting on this particular venture their purpose, their main purpose. And they said to develop, to help develop uh, willpower in the incarnate individual. And they said, uh, all they, they added, if you like, that. Uh, they would, uh, you know, be a, you know, a source of power, energy, if you like, um, behind any uh, incarnate individual's choice to develop their willpower in the face of, uh, shall we say, weakness and uh, lack of courage. And they said, but unfortunately, sometimes that willpower is developed in the wrong direction. The willpower is there, but it's the power to do what is conventionally considered harm rather than good. And in this case, uh, it was referenced to uh, abusers, people who wished before birth to develop the power, the willpower, to resist the temptation to be an abuser, but who uh, once incarnate um, sort of couldn't rise to the challenge uh, eventually. And uh, as we say, it fell into their old ways and then became rather good at it. And uh, had willpower in that direction to do their will to do what they wished to do, but uh, not to resist the temptation that got them into it in the first place. The temptation to do that which hurts others. And in many cases that would be sexual abuse, um, but not, not merely that, sometimes psychological abuse. And sometimes, uh, you know, abuse of power. And um, the guide would say, well, that, that often happens too, because the, uh, the victims uh, have, the, have the pattern of sacrificing themselves to others' power in order to gain acceptance and love. 
or you know friendship if you like uh, sympathy uh, and they too lack the willpower to resist and uh, have guides that are trying to give them the willpower but they either ignore or don't fully use the uh, that which is being offered them so as we can see that a lot of uh, guides in this guy no, i shouldn't say guy we'll just call him a guide and uh, would this person be a dead human being who has chosen to be a guide uh, yes I don't think we're talking angels here. We're talking dead human beings who have advanced fairly well along the path and have uh, chosen to take some, uh, <coughs> quote unquote, time out to be a guide. And uh, this uh, guide is speaking for others of his, uh, he says, band, he says, team, he says, um, organization those who help develop willpower and what we would call determination he uh, uh, I'll just use the, the the term he it doesn't seem terribly gender specific this guide um, but uh, just for the sake of uh, the uh, conversation He says it's been a great, uh, as we would call, learning curve to see how uh, those who would abuse and those who uh, succumb to abuse uh, form interlocking uh, patterns of behavior and uh, are caught in those interlocking patterns for uh, uh, weeks years and sometimes uh, quite often lifetimes many lifetimes and uh, uh, he also adds that uh, it's similar to uh, what we have or what you on earth have learned from uh, the past life regression experiences and studies where um, races will interweave in, uh, in the, the obvious uh, regular example is the uh, the white American who is an abuser of black Americans and uh, in his interlife period realizes his huge mistake and uh, becomes on the advice of guides uh, incarnates as a black person to experience abuse to experience the full throttle of what they have done in previous lives this has been referenced many times and he says it's a very good example of the uh, switching of roles to experience the uh, the other side of the coin and it does happen with uh, uh, the abusive and the abuser um, on more or, or, or in less racial terms but more um, psychological uh, terms and uh, and he as he as he as he points out uh, some of the uh, patterns go back as do with the uh, slave slave driver uh, pattern uh, right back to Egypt ancient Egypt and, and farther just to emphasize the uh, long-term nature of this particular pattern or program. And of course, in, the, in some lives, they opt out of those patterns and lead a not abusive, not victimized life. But then they can, they can fall into regular patterns when they're uh, the uh, weakness, the strength to resist is is weak. And of course this could be applied to, you know, almost anything. Uh, the strength to resist any abusive pattern or victimized pattern, whether it be drugs, alcohol, sex, power, uh, criminality. 
Um, and he says he's uh, learned a lot about these patterns and how uh, how he can help at, at uh, crisis points with uh, a flow of energy that would be or can be used as shoring up, uh, you know, a, a weakening uh, willpower, a weakening the sense of determination. Um, and I ask him, <laughs> is he a good angel or a bad angel? And he, he says, uh, it depends on your point of view. And uh, he said, a lot of it comes down to that, depends on your point of view. And uh, he also adds that uh, look at uh, how the how the the planet goes in terms of uh, interlocking behavior patterns and that move along in cyclic uh, patterns um, in terms of individuals and cultures that are abusive cultures he says and that are uh, cultures that are abused. And um, they fall into those patterns of uh, accepting what seems to be destiny or fate. He says uh, part of his job or uh, vocation is to uh, help uh, individual souls understand that nothing is determined by destiny or fate not ultimately uh, much is uh, decided by one's uh, desire to fight and buck against patterns and what seems to be what cultures call destiny and fate and uh, uh, and curses If one is laboring under a curse, and he, he emphasizes that curses are real in terms of their energetic, uh, in, you know, in, input, he says you just, uh, you can, uh, with sufficient determination, resist those curses and overpower them. But he says many, many souls uh, do not have that power, cannot locate that power, um, at least not in some lives. Um, and then he smiles and says, but it's all part of the game, evolving and getting stronger and getting more uh, adept at uh, balancing opposites and uh, uh, making what seems to be progress. He smiles when he says that, just as I do. And um, you're, you're thinking, does Gordon mean progress? And I would say... Uh, Progress is a ticklish uh, category to uh, either support or uh, not support. Uh, in that it does seem to me to be um, one's perspective. What really is progress is it technological progress, which we do seem to be on a path of, no question. But model progress, well, of course, that, that's, that's a difficult one. We can all see examples of uh, situations where no moral progress or ethical uh, cleansing has really been accomplished in thousands of years by either uh, countries or individuals. And uh, so one wonders, you know, is there such a thing as progress in ethics? Uh, that is for individuals. Again, those who resist the temptation to be unethical and um, of course in a, in a competitive capitalistic system there's huge encouragement to be competitive and to be aggressive and be ruthless because uh, they often in the short term are the winners although not necessarily in the long term so again he says it's encouraging and, and supporting willpower and determination but of course that willpower and determination can easily be turned into the quote-unquote wrong channels and uh, 
then one often, the soul, that is, one often gets into a situation where you're going head-to-head, toe-to-toe with another soul who is doing well in their utilization of willpower and determination. And uh, it's, you know, a competitive thing, uh, either in business or in sports or in even ordinary workplace uh, daily situations. And uh, I'm at, when asking what, what he would do to encourage people to understand this and, you know, better develop from the, uh, the, the, the conflicts, the energetic conflicts, he, uh, he suggests forgiveness. He says forgiveness has a great energy into itself. And you can learn to forgive yourself for not being strong enough consistently or being, uh, being the slave of uh, willpower and determination that you have previously developed and allowing it to rule you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a, a sense of forgiveness for uh, mistakes made or inappropriate actions uh, uh, propagated. And, uh, you know, he admits that when I challenge him on that, that that gets into the whole realm of discernment. How does one discern what is really improper? Because uh, certain souls, many of us, will accept a role before birth where some someone that we, we have karma with, someone that we know, and some more than one, will ask us to be uh, a challenge to their weakened sense of determination and to uh, push them toward a point where they uh, are f- seem forced to uh, increase their personal power and refuse through you know determination to be uh, abused or taken advantage of or you know used and therefore when we accept that role we accept a certain level of uh, implemented willpower uh, on a on a regular basis which will challenge that other soul to um, match that willpower and uh, you know overcome it so that they are not any kind of a victim, but they are a a self-asserting equal. And uh, I do like that phrase, self-asserting equal, because equality, although it's a great and true spiritual equality I'm talking about here, not just the perception of it um, or the desire for it, but the actuality of it, is um, one of the great goals of the evolutionary uh, pattern for mankind, but um, and not to be taken lightly, but um, it the struggle towards it is not just one of uh, uh, the uh, laws of uh, dem- democracies and the ethical and spiritual principles behind the formation of those laws. It is uh, a great effort on the part of many uh, individuals who don't feel strong enough to assert themselves and accept a lesser position or a weakened position. And he says, that's where I come in. Are people, you know, guides like me. When I ask how long he's been at this sort of uh, guiding business, he says something well over a hundred years. He says, and um, he says he, he won't be doing it forever. It's almost uh, you know it, it could well be time for him to be incarnate again in the next. Uh, he said he he says with a grin, little while, and as we know, uh, for guides and, uh, and semi permanent residents of the astral. The um, the call the whole notion of time is almost laughable, and they only use it to um, to uh, fit into our world and our conceptions. 
our patterns of behavior, which are, of course, um, uh, of necessity, blended with the dimensions of time and space. Because yeah, that is where we are. Um, and you're saying, Gordon, I, I can hear some of you saying, Gordon, surely you're not uh, insisting on the uh, the uh, absolute reality of time and space. Surely they're relative. And yes, they are. Of course they are. But it takes a fairly deep meditative experience to transcend them. Um, no, certainly not impossible, but uh, not uh, the easiest thing to achieve. I've, uh, you know, achieved it myself from time to time as a, as a, as a prisoner of time and space uh, in uh, meditative experiences or um, out-of-body experiences where you travel into those dimensions where time is meaningless um, and then, you know, have a great series of interesting experiences and then come back here and only three or four hours has transpired, you know, transpired and sometimes only a few minutes. So we've all had those experiences and we understand the enigmatic nature of them. Um, I would just add that one can achieve this in meditation too um, just by raising one's consciousness beyond the physical plane, I'd say even beyond the astral plane, up to a level where you can see the patterns of behavior in in your own and others incarnations going back a thousand two thousand years and you will see if you probe deeply enough and honestly enough a behavior pattern that you had we'll just use ancient egypt again as, as a good marker a couple of three three thousand four thousand years ago um behavior patterns that you developed there or were indulging in there and hey guess what you're still doing them here and you may have done them in every life between then and now but you have used it and you have been abused by it and uh so it's it's a long-term learning pattern but when you rise above it and you look down as it were on these incarnations, as higher self often does, you're raising yourself either to that level or almost to that level, um, you can see the little puppets on stage, driven by ambition and driven by passions and driven by fears. Uh, fear is often a passion. Um, and, you know, we're all actors upon the stage of life, as, as Shakespeare pointed out. Um, and you can see that and you can uh, simultaneously acknowledge the importance of working out those naughty issues and also the comedy of the foolishness of, of doing it uh, unconsciously, which we all do from time to time. And uh, you can gain that level of consciousness and see the, uh, the escape from uh, the dimensions of time and space, the three-dimensional world, and uh, relearn or re-understand what it means to exist beyond that and be an eternal being that is not uh, endlessly buffeted about by the, those, those uh, behavior patterns, those passions, those ambitions, those desires. And, uh, of course, you, you can experience those things in an out-of-body state or in a meditative state and still be affected by them later. You know, the, uh, the uh, dedicated, uh, devoted disciple who prays themselves into a state of uh, ecstatic communion with their, their divinity or their deity or their prophet can experience those things and then... Uh, some weeks, months, years later fall from that exalted state into what they would see as a, a state of sinfulness and uh, the experienced uh, meditator, the monk can also do the same thing with extended meditations and uh, 
fall from their, you know, previous state of grace where they were at one with, might have seen themselves to be at one with the universe and not a, uh, a unconscious uh, leaf in the wind. As uh, people often say, being blown about by, uh, the, you know, the winds of desire and uh, fear and doubt and ambition etc etc so uh, we can see again this pattern of uh, high understanding uh, fully understanding consciousness which sees the uh, the patterns understands the foolishness of unconsciousness where one is being used by those passions in order to just be a you know, a football being kicked around by the uh, the force of desire or the force of fear, or the, you know, any of those uh, eternal forces. And um, as with all metaphysical discussions here, uh, <laughs> on uh, OBE journal and whatnot, then one wonders, one can drift into wondering, what is the nature of these eternal uh, forces of, of ambition and desire and passion and fear? What is behind them? And that gets fairly abstruse. We are uh, the uh, tools of such things. And then we can use their force consciously as we can use the force of unconditional love. Um, to uh, achieve certain aims. Um, we can be the, the, the tool of these things or we can be the operator. Um, but their uh, original source, that gets fairly mystical. They've obviously been around for uh, thousands of years as part of uh, the... Uh, tools, shall we say, of the, you know, maybe the, uh, the forces that animate incarnate beings. Certainly when one is uh, med uh, either present or have meditated oneself into the Godhead, into the Elysian fields, the, the areas where the, uh, the higher self lives, one is not really the tool of ambition or passion or desire. One is beyond that. And one can look down and see all those beings animated by desire and fear and not be one of them. Uh, and uh, e exist there for that time and space, quote unquote, I'm not talking our time and space, and then dis feel that one should descend into that and once again battle with it, those forces that seem to kick us around. And uh, the, um, the seesaw between those two uh, states, being above it all and being uh, uh, enmeshed in the, 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 the frenzy of it all, uh, we can all oscillate between those, and we all have. And um, part of the point of these uh, discussions is to point out uh, how we all go through that. And, uh, what, and we can perceive it in terms of psychology and the, 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 the kind, type of psychology that we all uh, recognize and participate in with uh, counseling situations. And even friendship between uh, good old friends where one, one old friend will counsel another. And uh, you don't have to be part of the New Age movement to do that. Many uh, people do that. And, um, you know, we oscillate and we understand those things, at, at least at moments of reflection. And um, onward we go. And in our understanding of the complexity, the, the subtleties and complexities of these behavior patterns, which continue throughout our uh, adventures as created beings 
which is a phrase I like to use because we are created uh, as opposed to being uh, an energy in the unmanifest world, an energy of uh, intelligence and understanding. And then uh, we're not created there. We're boundless, infinite beings that then solidify themselves into small, <laughs> dense uh, bodies uh, for the sake of experience on this level. But uh, where we are buffeted about by all those uh, desires and fears and passions. Uh, and from down here in the created world in the uh, the the realms of time and space it it does feel like a very much an uphill battle against uh, opposing and conflicting forces which uh, throw us around like like uh, little balloons to be battered by this, that, and the other. And yet in the, uh, the uh, spiritual realms, especially being beyond uh, the hells and the heavens, we're talking because astral beings in either the hells, purgatories, or heavens, or paradises, they are not so much the tools of those conflicting uh, passions and desires they're more in control than perhaps we are down here because there's less to fight um, in terms of modes of control. There is no authoritarian structure, uh, and I use that loosely. I don't just mean uh, uh, repressive uh, dictatorships. I mean all forms of government and uh, uh, the, the set down rules. In the astral plane, there's very little of that hardly any at all and um, but there's still um, how should we say that they're experiencing their desires for pleasure and joyful interaction which is a wonderful thing I'm not not saying one shouldn't do it but uh, there's still the tools of those of those things they're still being used by those forces and they gain fulfillment and they gain uh, happiness through those experiences, but they haven't transcended them. Uh, they transcend them as those beings that we met in the previous uh, uh, discussion, uh, who are about to move into the, un, you know, uh, the formless worlds, the energy planes, where they're not created beings, but at least by my terms, and have dropped their personality and character and returned to. Their sort of state of all knowing, all understanding, sort of clouds of intelligence, which we all are ultimately. But, um, uh, so, you know, just to emphasize that a little bit, um, uh, we are, we are small gods. In, in, in reality, uh, although when we're in that state, we're completely out of being a person, a individuality, a created being. We're not in any position to exercise that power. That's a very interesting uh, uh, situation. We don't have a desire to exercise power or under or, or you know uh, that great state of understanding where we understand all all motivations all uh, rises and falls of cultures. There is a place where we understand all that, but we're not either in a position or in a uh, state where we wish to exercise that power. That sort of thing happens down here, not up there. Um, you sort of recognize the, the foolishness of uh, when you're omnipresent and omniscient, as I've said in the past in some of my books, um, the foolishness of even wanting to, to do anything at all. So you, you are sort of beyond that. And if you have that desire to uh, either uh, influence others or impose things that seem like wonderful things to impose, you are then descending from that 
omniscient, omnipresent state. You're solidifying yourself into the density of desire, even if it's a quote-unquote good desire. And um, of such notions is idealism born. And not that idealism isn't useful in the development of uh, individuals and cultures. It is. Um, so um, thanking that guide that I met for promoting this discussion, and uh, I, I've only quoted bits of my interaction with this uh, being um, to, to stimulate the discussion. Um, uh, it's good to uh, understand some of the uh, depths and subtleties of uh, being a guide and uh, promoting certain uh, situations and values and uh, forces which uh, propel us through the uh, experiences we need to become completed beings. Because that is that is what we're doing. We're, we're trying to graduate and be completed. And in order to do that, you have to experience all this stuff, the victim and the victimizer, the, the uh, abuser and the abused. And uh, th that leads to, when that understanding can lead to a viewpoint where one will say, as mystics have uh, throughout history, um, it's all sacred, all of it. It's all uh, divinely inspired. And of course, that is a view that many cannot hold because they cleave to the notion that good can exist without evil, that creation can exist without destruction, that uh, light can exist without dark. And I think we all realize here that it's the interaction of those polar opposites that create the uh, life and the ongoing sense of evolution and progress, at least progress in understanding, if not progress in, <laughs> in ethics, as we, we spoke earlier. Um, so <clears throat> as we move, all of us, not just me, everybody, towards the sense of being a completed being. Uh, I hope we can all uh, understand the necessity of all these forces and the uh, almost magical uh, uh, interaction of the, of the subtleties of the interaction uh, throughout time and space. And um, certainly I see it often in, uh, in what I would call drama and comedy, the classical sense of theater, which we now experience as much in theater, sorry, in film and, and, and uh, televised drama. Sitting back and watching characters go through the permutations of their fears and desires and emotions and um, passions. Uh, one has a chance to uh, reflect on it carefully. And uh, I've been noticing this while uh, re-watching the famous series Downtown Abbey. And uh, knowing the plot elements, one can focus on the subtleties of the characters rise and falls through their challenges and their uh, dramas and their uh, conflicts. It does seem like an image of life itself, doesn't it? Anyway, a small example that some of you may recognize and some of you may not. But uh, the theater is wonderful for that. Drama is wonderful for that. And I think uh, you study the writings of the Aristotle and other ancients, you'll see they understood that as well. 
um, good old Aristotle. Um, and uh, thus we uh, come to the end of this particular discussion and more of a, a ruminating discussion than uh, an exploratory uh, OBE trip, but uh, I did uh, encounter the, uh, the guide in, in an out-of-body state, so <laughs> I guess that qualifies. And um, I wish you well until our, our next uh, visit. <laughs>